system of the app. This will ensure that both your microphone and camera are turned on so that everyone can hear and see you clearly. If you forget to unmute during the call, there will be a pop-up. Yeah, Jimmy, uh, thanks. Of course, everyone knows Jimmy's the founder of Apple Daily and um, longtime pro-democracy person in Hong Kong. Uh, it's been a sad uh, 24 hours or so in Hong Kong, capping a, well, a difficult 24 years, I guess we'd say. Um, join, I'm Mark Clifford, and I'm joined uh, as well with by uh, Ray Burkhart, who uh, is a longtime um, head of the American Institute in Taiwan, serving uh, as the uh, de facto U.S. ambassador to Taipei, as well as Ten and a half years as chairman of uh, AIT back in the United States. Uh, so long-term expert on Taiwan, has also served as a U.S. State Department official in Shanghai, Beijing, was there in 1989, uh, Hong Kong, as well as Seoul, Manila, and other places. Um, so, uh, Jimmy, tell us a little bit about the, the mood in Hong Kong right now and uh, uh, how, how everybody's feeling after this shock uh, uh, overturning of, of the opposition in LegCo. Well, it's shocking. It's shocking because they DQ the four legislators, and that means that the you know the the demo, the, the pan democratic legislators laws the, even the minority to stop any bill. So it's useless. It's useless to be there. So you know they decided to resign en masse yesterday. Well, this is the rape of Hong Kong. You know, Hong Kong, this is the last nail on the Hong Kong co coffin. But let's, let's put it this way. Because now, Hong Kong, you cannot have any demonstration. The street resistance is almost finished. Hong Kong is not in peace, but in the silence of suffocation. So we were hoping that those legislators could get into the Legislative Council and fight there against bad views. So at least by fighting there, the world still sees the news and remember Hong Kong. Now, even the Legislative Council is totally uh, uh, pro-government legislators, and these legislators, would, would, together with us, cannot do anything in the street. That means Hong Kong will be deprived of all the news, and the world will forget us. And if the world forget us, we are totally done. You know that the way that they DQ the they, they DQ the, the the legislators is the last nail they put on the rule of law of Hong Kong's coffin. So it shows to the world CCP really doesn't care doesn't care. You know, in front of the world, they just do whatever they like violating the, the rule of law, everything. So I hope the world will take notice and come to our, our aid and support us. Yeah, thanks. For anybody who, who missed the news who's outside of Hong Kong, the National People's Congress in Beijing decreed that four uh, serving legislators um, would, uh, would be tossed out immediately on uh, quite technical grounds. The rest of the opposition camp uh, resigned. So LegCo, the, the city council of Hong Kong, uh, has no opposition members and uh, doesn't appear likely to have any anytime soon. Um, Ray, uh, any uh, any comments you'd like to make on this? Um, Jimmy has described it all uh, pretty well. And I think um, I agree with him that they don't care. Beijing doesn't, they, they clearly are, they really don't care what the reaction of the world is to this. Uh, and it, it, there was a time when Beijing used to say that uh, the way one country, two systems was handled in Hong Kong could be a good uh, model for Taiwan. They don't even bother with that anymore. Right. Um, but as reading this news this morning, I was reminded there were a number of times in meetings with the Taiwan Affairs Office of the Chinese Communist Party with the director or the deputy director of the office. Um, we would ask them, I would ask them, I would say, OK, what happens in Taiwan under one country, two systems? What happens to the opposition party? 
or what happens to the to the to the DPP, the the pro independence party? Would they be allowed to function under one country, two systems? There was never any answer. Well, right. now we have the answer, as shown in what happened in Hong Kong. Um, I, go back and look at Beijing's language over the years about one country, two systems. The emphasis always was that Hong Kong and Taiwan could keep their economic systems, could keep their social systems. Never or maybe almost never was there ever any mention or any promise of keeping the political system. And you stay all this about this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I was just looking at a WhatsApp from an old, somebody I've known a long time, actually a former Western diplomat, who said, you know, that there's so much grandstanding, so much that the opposition was just an opposition, they've obstructed, that, you know, they, they in a way open it up for Beijing to, to do something like this. Is, is that a fair comment, Jimmy? What do you say is because uh, the opposition just make, does like make troubles, but doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have any constructive results, right? That's what he says, right? Well, what can we do? With, hands, with our hands down, and just let them do whatever they like. What the, if they want to rape us, they can just make us openly. <laughs> no, we have to fight. Even if you know that, fighting is useless. Even if you know that, fighting will not bring us victory. The fighting shows to the world of our desire, our integrity for democracy, you know, our, our integrity of, home, of human dignity. You know, we have to fight like a human. We have to show to the world that we are not giving up. Nobody give up and have democracy. The reason why we have democracy today is just because a lot of people were fighting wars. They know they're going to lose. And yet at the end, we have it. And this is the result. The history shows the result. You know, now the problem with Hong Kong is the only saving grace we have is the, from, is the voice and support of the international community now without the news, without anything we can do on the street. There won't be any news. And the world is tend to forget us. Once they have forgotten us, we can't do anything. So, you know, for Hong Kong now, either you immigrate or you become subservient to the regime, which does use control and suppression to manage us. You say it's the last nail in the coffin, but Apple Daily is still uh, publishing, as, as Carrie Lam has reminded us. Uh, you're still talking. Um, you know, the coffin's not completely nailed shut. Well, well uh, one thing about freedom of speech, another about freedom of speech when you have to speak and act under the shadow or, or, or the, threat, the, 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 the threat of intimidation. You know, when, when, what we do now, we don't do it freely. We do it with a shadow of fear. We do it with a shadow of a possibility of being arrested. You know, this is not freedom of speech. You know, they, maybe, you know, they have to, they have to keep, they have to keep the uh, uh, next digital or, or Apple Daily as a showcase to prove that, you know, the freedom of speech is still here until they have the opportunity to cram us down. Maybe it's not yet. Maybe, you know, they have to wait until the, you know, the political expedience allows them to do so. Let's see. It's also been interesting that the courts have uh, been pushing back and have not been accepting a lot of the government right. prosecution cases. Although yeah. we can see there's a campaign uh, to deal with that as well. So, you know, perhaps another nail uh, uh, coming. I don't know, Ray, what do you think? You, you were based in Hong Kong. It's a long time ago, but you, you, you follow Taiwan more closely than Hong Kong. But what should, uh, what is Hong, we're about half, we're not quite halfway through, didn't quite make it to the halfway point of the uh, 50 years of the special administrative region. What do you think uh, Hong Kong has to look forward to in the next couple of years? I don't think the world is going to forget about Hong Kong. I mean, I think, um, I, I, I understand Jimmy's point about the difficulty in generating news. Right. in this repressed environment. But I think 
there's a lot of there's a lot of affection for Hong Kong and a lot of interest and a lot of foreigners who spend a lot of time there. So, uh, um, interestingly, uh, the Western press seems to be trying to look at different sides of this issue. I, I just read an article in the New York Times that talks about how the the creation of the Greater Bay Area um, is opening up economic opportunities for people in Hong Kong to do to to especially white collar type businesses to uh, open open offices in uh, in uh, various parts of Guangdong. And uh, some people are think, thinking that this is a is going to be an, a money making opportunity for them. So uh, um, that hardly uh, compensates for the loss of uh, freedom of speech and the loss of, uh, of, of, of political rights. But it um, it shows at least some cleverness on the part of uh, of the mainland to uh, of Beijing to uh, placate some people there in Hong Kong. No, I, I think that the the the, the bigger bay, the bigger bay uh, area, is to dilute the autonomy of Hong Kong. Is to dilute mm -hmm. the Hong Kong people yeah. as a community which share a very different value as opposed to the Chinese in China. The reason yeah. the world pays so much attention to us is because they feel, they feel in the heart the pain and suffering of what we are suffering because they share the same value as us. And Hong yeah. Kong is important because Hong Kong has a very unique value which can be beacon to spread to China. And that's where they are afraid of. And that's why they want to dilute yeah. this value from us. And I, I, think I, I think this is the purpose of you know, the bigger Bay Area. I think I think there may be another more also in, in more more insidious sort of uh, economic aspect. You're going to see uh, that you're already seeing. I'm already hearing about how investment banks and uh, particularly other financial industry companies in Hong Kong feel they now need to have Mandarin speakers, right. uh, native native speakers, in their offices in Hong Kong. And you're seeing more and more people from the mainland coming in and taking those jobs away from from Hong Kong people because the economic integration is 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 making those that kind of talent more desirable in the Hong Kong companies. Yeah. Well, so let's uh, let's get back to this issue of uh, of the world uh, forgetting or not forgetting Hong Kong. Um, we uh, in the U.S. Uh, had an election uh, a week or so ago, and it looks pretty likely there will be a change of administration. Um, we talked about this a bit last week when it wasn't quite clear if uh, if uh, President Trump would be reelected or not. But um, Ray, how do you think that um, that's if it is a Biden administration, what's that going to mean for Hong Kong and, and for Taiwan? Yeah, I mean, I I think the um, I've given frankly more thought to the Taiwan issue just because uh, there's yeah. been a lot of a lot of discussion among those of us who follow Taiwan carefully about this issue in the last week. On the Hong no, Kong please, issue, please go ahead on Taiwan, though. That's, but, that's yeah, not, I mean, I, I, I don't have much to say about the, how it would affect the views on, on, on Hong Kong. I think um, uh, the, the, the rhetoric, the tone from, from, from the administration is likely to be, uh, be less, um, less sharp, I would say, on, on the Hong Kong issue. Um, Pompeo kind of set the tone, and I don't think you're going to see that quite equal by whoever replaces him. Pretty hard to imagine any anybody yeah. else, Republican or Democrat, matching Pompeo on Hong Kong. I've seen I've seen a certain amount of you know some expressions of anxiety uh, in Taiwan about whether a Biden administration is going to be um, just as friendly, just as supportive. Uh, and I, you know, I traditionally in Taiwan there tends to be a, an attitude that Republican administrations are friendlier. Uh, than Democratic administration in the United States. Um, as a Republican who's worked for both Republican and Democratic administrations on Taiwan, I'm not sure how valid that is. Uh, for one thing, you have great unity, bipartisan unity uh, on Taiwan in the Congress. Uh, some of Taiwan's uh, greatest supporters are actually Democrats in the, in the Senate so, um, and in the House. In terms of uh, the people coming into this administration, assuming it is a Biden administration, I work very closely with a lot of them, uh, particularly uh, Tony Blinken, 
uh, when he was Deputy Secretary of State, rumored as a good, very possible choice for a National Security Advisor, uh, Susan Rice, uh, Kurt Campbell, and I worked together very, very closely. Also, Evan Medeiros, all these people um, were my, my, my colleagues, my uh, comrades in arms in terms of Taiwan policy. Uh, and our goal in the Obama administration, I mean, I began these jobs in the, in the Bush administration, but continued into the Obama administration. Um, the goal always was we were going to treat Taiwan as important in its own right, not as some subset of our policy toward uh, Beijing. And Beijing hated that. They hated that approach, but we did it. Um, I would say on, on issues like arms sales to Taiwan, uh, I was often the advocate in meetings with, with Hillary Clinton. In my very last meeting as AIT chairman at the end of 2016, the very end of the Obama administration with Tony Blinken about an arms sale at that time, basically I was pushing against an open door. They, they, uh, they supported that, they got it. They completely got it about how Taiwan needed to maintain as much deterrent capability, as much cut capability to slow down any possible uh, mainland attack as possible. Um, very supportive. So I'm not, I'm not worried, I'm really, about, about those people taking, you know, having significant roles on Taiwan policy. I would also say something that um, you wouldn't hear too many of us who are Republicans saying, but I, frankly, Trump um, never was 100% reassuring on Taiwan policy. Uh, the transactional approach that he took toward foreign policy in general was worrisome to me. It was worrisome to many of my friends in Taiwan also. I mean, I remember um, distinctly conversations with both KMT and DPP, high level political figures who said, Trump never talks about democracy. Uh, we always talk about our shared values being very important. He never says that. Should we be worried? I'm worried, they, you know, they would say. And I, it was hard for me to tell them not to be worried about that. Uh, and then we got, uh, we got John Bolton's comments about how Trump had been very dismissive of Taiwan as being uh, tiny, unimportant, why should I care? Uh, I'm trying to do a trade deal with Beijing. So um, all of that's gonna be behind us also. Uh, you know, I, one thing that I, I I'm not sure is widely known is that in, in meetings with the Chinese, when they would raise the issue of arms sales to Taiwan, Trump's favorite response was they're great customers. That's, I mean, that's hilarious. And um, thinking of the reaction of the Chinese who undoubtedly never heard that response from an American president ever before <laughs> on the issue is pretty funny, but it also, it has its worrisome aspect. <laughs> That, yeah. that was so so um, so I think that's that would be my my comment on that. I think um, yeah. I, so I I, I think um, you I, I, I think any any you know sort of nervousness that's there um, I think will be dispelled by the actions of the new administration. Yeah, I mean we have a big arms sale that's going to continue to go through. Yeah. I think. Well, I, yeah, go ahead, Jimmy. I'm not sure that you know the last uh, arms sale will be will 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 not be delayed. I, I just don't know, you know, because I I I I've witnessed that the greatest arms sale to Taiwan is during Trump's uh, administration, and there's an intention of Trump upgrading Taiwan into the international community, and that was very obvious. Okay, yeah. I think with Biden, definitely it's much easier for Taiwan to align the, with the European alliance, the Asian alliance, because Biden can, you know, can have a better alliance in both places, which could be beneficial to Taiwan if there's a political will in the Biden administration to assert this. But I'm afraid that the Biden administration will be too cautious. It's unlike Trump. Trump is more, you know, brinsmanship. Let, let's, let's, let's put it this way. You know, he, he's more gutsy in asserting what he thinks Taliban needs. 
and Biden will be much more cautious. You know, doesn't want to risk any war possibility with China. With, with, with China. You know, but I think Trump would just risk that, and knowing that you know CCP would not dare to start a war, which I don't think Biden would have such a, 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 a strong will and and let's say you know such a, a, a aggressiveness. So I, I'm I'm actually worried about Taiwan because you know Taiwan is in the middle of upgrading itself into the international community. All of a sudden, changes the administration. That might be a blow to Taiwan's uh, 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 upgrade. Uh, you know, upgrade. Mm. Uh, I, I hope you're right, Ray. You know, I, yeah. I, 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 I have to see. But one thing I still think the administration will still look at Taiwan as a very important strategic issue, because people back, you know, people to Asia need Taiwan as a leverage to China. You know, Taiwan is in a very important strategic position to leverage China. And I don't think that Biden administration will overlook that. Okay, but we, they will be more cautious. They will not, they will try not to offend China, which Trump will not care. And that's the difference. You know, they're both anti-CCP, but the actions is what it can. I think Trump is more action-oriented, and the Biden administration will be more rhetoric-oriented. You know, so, I, Ray, if, Ray, if as, you as I'm advising, listening to that, if, go ahead, Mark. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, if you were advising uh, the new national security advisor or the president, what would you say to, to reassure someone like Jimmy or to reassure uh, friends in Taiwan that uh, there isn't just going to be a lot of rhetoric, but it's, they're going to be soft on China? I'll get to that, but what, I'm, what I wouldn't say to them, but what I, would, what I would be thinking is I'd be thinking back on the times in which there were some positive moves made toward Taiwan, including people who were sent there at times when Trump was negotiating his trade agreements. And when he heard about these people visiting Taiwan, he was furious. And, and he, um, you know, sometimes positive moves made toward Taiwan at, at moments when Trump thought it was going to affect his trade negotiations, uh, um, got very negative reactions from Trump. Mm. Uh, mm. So the, I mean, there wasn't too much public attention to that. It did leak out a little bit. But uh, so I, 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 he was always sending mixed signals, frankly. Yeah. Right? yeah. It, was, well, that, it was, never as clear, was never as clear cut as, 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 you, as you portrayed it, Jimmy, I think, uh, unfortunately. Um, what would I say to the next administration? Um, definitely have to move ahead with those arms sales. Don't show any, any hesitation about them. Maybe even throw in a few more items. Uh, you know, definitely show that that, 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 appro that, that um, concern about Taiwan's deterrent cap capability is something that's given a high priority by the administration. Um, move ahead with trade talks with Taiwan which the Trump administration actually has not done. Um, they would have, would have done it. Uh, Taiwan made the offer with the pork and beef uh, moves, uh, uh, liberalizations uh, announced by Tsai Ing-wen mm -hmm. to take effect on January 11th. But, um, and then there were positive statements by uh, Pompeo and by others in the administration, but not a word out of Lighthizer, the, the U.S. trade representative. Not a word about wanting to negotiate a trade agreement with Taiwan. Well, whoever gets named the new U.S. trade representative, make sure that he says that he wants to negotiate a trade agreement with Taiwan. That would be a very important step, both for practical reasons and for, and for political and strategic reasons. Right, right. Well, I hope, I hope you're right, Ray. If this, yeah. you know, if they... they they continue the arms sales, even add a few more items to show that, you know, they know that to deal with CCP, you have to deal it with strength, not weaknesses. Right. You know, if I'm you are cautious, you show your weaknesses and they will bury you. And this is very obvious. Right. You know, I, I, I think, you know, the, 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 the trade deal with Taiwan, they should proceed immediately to show that, you know, they are not afraid, you know, they have to show the strength because, the Biden administration shows to CCP that they are weak. 
you have to overcome this image by acting, but not by saying. You know, like you say, you know, selling more, few more items to Taiwan, have the trade deal done, and also maybe you know, get 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 a few more uh, 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 military rehearsals and all that in Taiwan to make sure that you know Taiwan understand that you know the support from U.S. is there. It's yeah. very important for Asia to see how Taiwan is being treated by the U.S. Because That's the credibility right. yeah. builds on how the U.S. treat Taiwan in the face of the CCP threat. Right. You know, yeah, it, it, good. It, it, it's the same story as Berlin at that time. If the U.S. was not tough on, on, on Berlin, right. Berlin would have fall, fallen to the Russia and, and Europe would have, you know, would have great problem to unite together on the side of the, of the U.S. The same thing will happen to Asia, only that this time China is a lot stronger and more powerful than Russia at that time. So the, the fortitude to deal with China needs a lot more political will than before. Two, two comments. One is I, talking about arms sales, I was reminded not only in the Obama administration, but in the Bush administration before it, there would often be a lot of discussions about the right timing for announcing an arms sale. And sometimes it seemed as if no time was ever the right time. If we were going to have some kind of summit with Beijing or we were going to, uh, we were negotiating something with Beijing, it was always, always seemed like a good reason to kick the decision down the road. And um, that has been much less true in the Trump administration. And I certainly hope that, I mean, it would be very important to stick with that approach. Uh, don't go back to the uh, constant search for the perfect moment to uh, notify no. Congress yes, about an yes. arms sale to Taiwan, because there never is a perfect no, moment. No, won't, that won't come yeah. the right, right time for this that, kind of thing. That would be, that would be one, another piece of advice I would give. Um, the other thing is, I think we've got good relations now with Australia, a good dialogue with Australia and with Japan. Uh, and with India also on dealing with China, on China issues. Let's make Taiwan a very important part of that dialogue. This is a very good point. This is a very good point. Yeah. 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 I think, I think the Biden administration should make Taiwan one of those, how the squad is called, court? It, quad, quad, quad. Yeah. You know, the, one of the members of the court, you know, alliance. It should be a quad, it should be a quad <laughs> issue, high, high on the list. Yeah. 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 How, how about other ways, other signals? Uh, obviously, the U.S. pulled out of the World Health Organization, so it's hard to push. But if the U.S. were back in WHO, can it get Taiwan observer status again? Should there be high-level administration officials visiting, as we saw during the Trump administration? Are there other symbolic moves that could be made? Definitely going back into the WHO, uh, if we do that, gives us um, much greater play in terms of, of lobbying for Taiwan to be included in the WHA. Right now, that's a bit, this today, that's a big issue in Taiwan because right. the WHA meeting that was supposed to be, this is the World Health Assembly meeting, the annual meeting, um, which Taiwan used to have a, be, during the Ma administration, it was able to, uh, to have an observer, which that was then cut off with Beijing's influence uh, once Tsai was elected. Um, the meeting in May was um, somewhat truncated because of the pandemic, and now they're having a follow-up virtual meeting, and uh, Taiwan's not being included. So that's a that's right now that's a big issue. So uh, sure, if we, if we're not at the table, it does, it's a little hard to lobby for uh, something to be done. But if we're at the table, it is. Similarly, with the um, I think in terms of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, I don't expect that to be something that the Biden administration immediately raises. Um, even you know, in the Democratic Party, they have their own problems with uh, trade agreements. So, uh, but and you know, not universal support for trade agreements in the Democratic Party. But uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership you know, was certainly uh, something that the Obama administration supported, and a lot of the people who are going to come into the administration with Biden are people who supported it. And again, uh, if we're in it, and if we're and, and if we get ourselves into it, which wouldn't happen right away, but if we get into it. We can then push for Taiwan to be in it. 
Yeah, I, I, I think the, the Biden administration will be more agreeable with the China trade than Trump because, you know, they are more friendly with the Wall Street people. They are more friendly with the big corporates and all those they want. They want better trade with China. I think, you know, politically, this is, this, this is very difficult for the Democrats to really do the same thing that, you know, the tough play, play hardball with China like Trump did. Another thing that, you know, I think the Biden administration can help Taiwan by enabling Japan to have a greater align with Taiwan. You know, because Japan is changing its, 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 its uh, constitution. And, and, and I think that's an opportunity for Japan to have a closer alliance with Taiwan strategically and militarily. Yeah. You know, on terms of the, I understand your point about the Biden administration and the Democrats and ties to Wall Street and wanting better relations with China, economic relations. Um, yeah, that's there's some truth to that. But on the other hand, the Trump, Trump administration was absolutely allergic to multilateral trade agreements. And um, that wasn't, you know, in my opinion, that was not wise and not in the interests of our Asia policy and not in the interest of Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan needs to be in multilateral trade agreements. And if the U.S. is in, in those agreements, it can help Taiwan get in. So um, and some of those agreements like the TPP were very explicitly did not include China. So, um, you know, th th that was a self-inflicted wound for us to drop out of that. So mm -hmm. I hope I hope I hope that wound is repaired also. Yeah. And, hey, and I think that would uh, be beneficial for Taiwan. Yeah, we're coming to the end. Of, Ray and I are going to drop off pretty soon. Uh, I want to let Ray make a few points and then kick it over to Jimmy. But I, I would say, I mean, historically, the Republicans have been closer to Wall Street. Obviously, Wall Street has been in the yeah. last 20 or so years, you know, in the Clinton and Obama years had had good, good uh, ties into the Democratic Party. I think that Biden is going to have to uh, be moving left. I mean, he's not going to be as close to the to Wall Street as as certainly as Clinton was. So, you know, that might be that might set up a different dynamic as well. And I, I think people in America have, the, as Ray said, there's a bipartisan consensus that what China is doing to its neighbors, Hong Kong, Taiwan, others, is very, very worrying. And I, I think, you know, Americans are slow to anger, but, uh, you know, there is a consensus. And I don't think there are going to be any sweetheart deals with China. Um, we did talk last week, Ray, I mean, um, Jimmy and our guests last week were worried that Biden would be so eager to get a climate deal with China that, uh, you know, some other issues might fall by the wayside. And I, I think that's something to watch carefully. But I, I do yeah. think Congress is going to hold the, the administration's feet to the fire. I mean, that's my sense. But, hey, Ray, you want to make it's been great having you. You want to make uh, some final remarks? I'll turn it over to Jimmy and then he's going to do a Q&A with uh, with the audience. I, I think I've made most of my points. I mean, um, being worried about these things is 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 natural for a place which ha like Taiwan, which is uh, uh, always has a lot to worry about. It, yeah. it, 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 it's um, it's in a in a very delicate, very uh, um, always very dangerous situation. So it has to worry, and um, so we should we should be sympathetic uh, uh, to Taiwan's concerns. And uh, Jimmy is right. The way to deal with those is not only to say the right things, but to do some right things also. Well, I, I, I hope the Biden administration realized that now is a changed world, that the world understands China a lot more than they do just a few years ago, you know, especially right. after the pandemic. You know, if they're using the Obama, old people in the administration, and those guys are using the same vision they have all of the world of China, that will be disaster. You know, I, 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 I hope they, you know, facing a different world, they will have the, they will have use, they'll have to use different strategy. And, 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 and I think this is very important. They have to be more aggressive. They have to take more risks because for the world to change, we can't just engaging China or containing China, we have to have a more aggressive way of changing, restructuring the, the, the world system. You know, we know now, 
with China sharing a very different values and attitude to the international dealings. The world cannot have peace, but constant conflicts if we don't change the way China deal with the world. And that is fundamental. That needs a real restructuring of the strategy and the attitude we face China or CCP. Ray, Ray, you know these people. They're your friends. Uh, we are probably going to get these these people who served in the Obama administration. Do they? Do they? Can they change with the times? I've been involved in a lot of um, study groups and discussion groups in the last um, last few weeks, uh, specifically on U.S. Taiwan policy. And um, they're they're bipartisan, but they they have a lot of. They deliberately have a lot of people in them who will be in, a, in an Obama administration, likely to be in an Obama administration. Uh, um, I think Bi maybe a Biden administration. I'm sorry, I meant a Biden administration. They were in an Obama administration. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and um, I, there, there is, there's, there's almost universal recognition of, of how things have changed and the need to, to, uh, uh, to be more realistic about ways of dealing with, with, with China. Um, there, I saw, I haven't even read the article, but I saw it quoted today in something I read today by Kurt Campbell and somebody who was a deputy uh, national security advisor under Obama, in which they acknowledged that they um, had been overly optimistic about Xi Jinping, had not, had not anticipated the extent to which China would use uh, the, uh, the um, development of 5G and the uh, development of its infrastructure uh, program worldwide uh, um, to uh, challenge our interests. And uh, that, um, that had been a mistake. And they're not going to repeat the mistake. And the mistake can't be repeated in the next administration. So uh, there is some, some self-criticism and, uh, and self-realization going on. Well, I hope that the Biden administration is the, not the third term of Obama administration. If it is, <laughs> it will be disastrous because the Obama administration's foreign policy has been disastrous. Yeah. Jimmy, we'll, uh, we'll leave it there. And uh, you're going you're gonna to stay on and do Q&A. Uh, okay, Ray and you. I will we'll drop it. Yeah, thanks so much, Ray. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank you, Ray. Right, this is a very okay. valuable section of opinion that you gave today yeah yeah very really great you're a real expert because you know everything yeah well, thank I you all right so great thank you thanks yeah. see you next time thank you mark yep right. thanks jimmy bye thank you thank you so much uh, mark and mr burkhart for that um lively conversation we have one audience member joining us uh and then we will move on to a couple of video questions uh, Mr. Huang, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, do you have a question for uh, Mr. Lai? Oh, yes, I do. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, please. Hello, Mr. Huang, we can't hear you right now. Can you please um, ask your question? Okay, so I will go ahead with my question. Yes, please. Hi, Mr. Lai. It's very good to see you. Uh, my question is about the strategy in the pro-democracy movement. Uh, since 2011, we have witnessed a lot of pro-democracy movements in the world. Uh, some are successful, some are not. Even today, people in Thailand, people in Belarus, they are still fighting for democracy. My question is, do you think it's a better strategy for pro-democracy uh, movement to work with someone inside the government to overthrow the current regime or to change the current regime. So like in Egypt, uh, it's kind of people uh, after the protest, another general came into power. So do you think working with uh, factions within the regime is a good strategy for pro-democracy movement. More specifically in Hong Kong, in retrospect, do you think in 2014 during the Umbrella Revolution, it's wiser for pro-democracy camp in Hong Kong to accept the bad deal, the fake uh, 
election at that time, Jia Pu Xuan. Is it better to accept a bad deal than no deal at all? So I want to hear your opinion. Well, I think it's always better that you don't compromise because once you compromise, you have to compromise more and more. Once you back down, you have to be you have to back down more and more. You know, if something is 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 fake, you should not accept it. I I don't understand what you say about working with people in the administration because you know you can't expect people in administrations will subvert the government within. <laughs> this is not this is not possible. Even is it possible? If even if there's there are people like like that within the administration, they won't deal with that, you know, won't, won't we deal with the pro democracy people just to expose themselves. No, I don't think, you know, I don't think that this is possible. But, you know, as, as I said earlier, even knowing that there's no victory for us, we still have to keep fighting just because to keep our integrity and to, to of, of, of the, of, of the fight for democracy and the dignity as a human being. You know, I, I, you know, the fight is what it means. Whether we will have the positive end is something that we hope for, but that is not something to justify or not justifying our fight. We have to fight just because we are humans. We should have the dignity of freedom and rule of law. Okay. Thank you so Thank much, you. Bill, for your question. Uh, Jimmy, now we'll move on to video questions. Let me share my screen with you. And here we have the first question. I think a lot of people are like me, you know, really give himself to the fight for democracy and freedom. So because Hong Kong is our home, I'm sure a lot of people doesn't even mind sacrifice himself to protect this, 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 this home of theirs. But it doesn't mean that we can always do that. But trying to fight for it and to show the world that we do it because we are keeping the dignity of a human being can be very effective for the outside world to support us. You know, if the whole, the outside world has to help us, their voice, their support is our saving grace. And this is very clear. But to have the world respond to us, we must fight as a human being to keep our dignity and to fight for freedom and the rule of law. And they will understand it. And they will have the greatest resonance on, on, you know, to us. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, now we have uh, one last question for today, and let me play this question for you. Lisa, 
點樣去能夠知道支持到香港嘅民主派啊？佢哋有冇受人威脅啊？同埋、呃、我哋點樣可以做得更好咯？呃、我諗好多市民已經係支持我哋紅田海日報，我哋真係好感激啊！而即係我哋紅田海日報咧，而家咧係需要好多市民。如果你哋可以真係誒、呃、訂閱啊，咁啊更好啦，因為我哋喺經喺我哋嘅經濟基礎上邊，我哋都唔係好穩健嚇。咁、啊、就而家你話點樣樣去支持誒、呃、民主派啊嗰啲咧？我哋而家咧，譬如甚至乎民主派喺喺呢個誒、呃、立法會而家推曬落嚟。我哋冇咗喺立法會裏面一個抗爭嘅平台，我哋喺街頭亦冇一個抗爭嘅平台。呢、這個咧係我哋而家面對一個從來未有過嘅困境嚟嘅。到底民主派係會點樣做？而家我諗佢哋都唔知道嘅嚇。咁、啊、所以咧，我都真係好難講俾你聽，你點樣可以 support 到佢哋？而家唯一可以支持到佢哋嘅咧，就係佢哋有好多官司。嚇、啊！即係而家佢哋乜嘢一個政呢個政府乜嘢都係拉佢哋嘅，咁所以佢哋好多需要好多律師費喺個眾籌局喺個眾籌嗰方面係盡量支持佢哋嚇去打官司，呢、這個咧係第一步可以支持到佢哋嘅嚇。Well， 誒、uh, Apple Daily， you know it's it's financially shaky， and if you want to support Apple Daily， the best thing is to subscribe。You know, I'm very grateful for what the Hong Kong people have done in support of us. And you know, as for the Pan Democrats, they don't have the strategy yet. You know, now they resign totally from the Legislative Council. They don't have a platform to fight there, and they don't have another platform to fight in the street. So <coughs> I I think they have to find a new strategy until this new strategy comes comes. I don't know what to say to you of how to support them, but for you to support them now <coughs> is to support their crowdfunding for the legal expenses <coughs> they will have to expense in, in you know <coughs> in the fight of all their charges. They need a lot of money. <coughs> To fight the legal charge that they have now, because the government just arrests them left and right, <coughs> trumping up all the charges. So they need your support financially to have the legal expenses <coughs> in place for them to fight. That's all I can say now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jimmy, for your time. <coughs> and we want to thank our guests. And our audience members who have、um, asked questions to you too.、Um, we look forward to seeing everyone again next week, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Okay.